So I'll try to make it informative. And obviously my goal here is to talk not only about how we conceived of the company and how we're sort of thriving as an independent publishing model, but also how in a very real case study that gets broken down into something that's replicable. You know, earlier today, I just got off the phone with another independent magazine publisher talking about this very subject. And so I know that if you are a creative who is running your own small business in, a, in the media ecosystem, it's really crucial to not only understand how to do amazing editorial work, um, which in and of itself is no small feat, but also how to essentially pay for that editorial work and how to make sure that your company is basically sticking around long enough to, to do that impactful work that you want to do. And so um, my talk is not meant really to be a lecture um, as much as it is uh, sort of a, an open forum for discussion. I'll go through an initial sort of look at us and how we are and then that case study. And then I'd love to hear some questions. Um, you know, uh, I often find whenever I talk about Racket and what we're up to, I learn just as much from the questions people ask and from my fellow, fellow pres presenters and panelists. Um, so it's definitely gonna be more fun for me if there's questions or, or things you wanna kind of go back to or linger on. Racket is a print magazine. It's also a multimedia company, a creative agency, an events production studio, and a vital e-commerce outfit all concerning the culture of tennis that gives us a broad swath. But the one thing that unites all of these concepts is our storytelling and our sensibility. Um, we call it sort of a lifestyle brand. Um, that's not to shy away from the fact that we're very, very much a media company, but it's essentially to make it understood in all the different worlds in which we occupy. Part of that is being on a shelf at a newsstand. Uh, and the other part of it is throwing a massive event where we can celebrate the writers and creators and subjects that we cover um, at a you know massive rooftop tennis court in the middle of Midtown, for example, which is something we're going to do later on this summer. Um, we reach a niche audience. It's not about mass for us, but it's about tastemakers and people who want to feel like they can walk in the door of our world. Obviously, the magazine can live on their coffee tables. It's collectible. People love buying not only the current issue, but going backwards and buying every single one of them. We've sold out of almost every copy of our back issues. Um, and the reason is people feel like it's their discovery. Um, and because of this, our model is very, very much not ad supported. Before we started today's chat, Mel and I are talking about, um, you know, mass versus niche. And I used to work at Time Magazine. And, you know, I think we had upwards of you know, 800, 1.2 million subscribers. It sort of varied um, the years I was there. But the point was nobody felt like it was their own thing. Whereas for us, we have a much, much, much smaller reach. We tend to reach around five people across all of our platforms digitally per month. But, you know, really the print circulation is, is quite small, but they'll show up, they'll travel to come to one of our parties across the globe. They'll buy a $2,000 watch or they'll voraciously consume our podcast digital content and, and, all the stuff that we give them that has no cost associated because they like feeling like they're part of things. So this is me and my co-founder, David Shaftel. Our background is both mostly in print journalism. As a matter of fact, I have a degree in magazine journalism from the University of Missouri, whereas Asna noted I played D1 college tennis. Um, my partner, David, uh, went to Columbia J School, but most of our background was in the New York Times, The Economist, um, Time Magazine, as I mentioned, I worked for the Washington Post. And basically we kind of felt like the algorithm and digital journalism that had started to eat media alive wasn't supporting the kind of storytelling that we knew we wanted to do, especially within the lens of tennis. And so our approach, even though we came up in this sport and love it very, very, very much, um, and really felt like we had something to add to it, was more from the outsider perspective of let us bring all these amazing photographers, writers, creators, and you know, visual artists and bring them into this tiny sport and kind of make it a little bit more modern and you know, kind of disrupt the energy of, of a very sort of corporate kind of staid storytelling. So that was nearly seven years ago. Um, we'll be celebrating uh, really our sixth official anniversary this summer at, with the US Open, but we had about a year of incubation period that I'm more than happy to talk about with uh, everyone in, in the event that somebody is currently incubating and an idea and needs a little kick in the pants to get their idea out the door. Um, so obviously the main sort of uh, subject matter that's gonna be very familiar, I think to most people on this call is editorial. Um, like I said, both of our backgrounds are in journalism, long form editors, writers, um, and finding people to create 
this aspect of our company is no small challenge, but it's also in a lot of ways, the easiest part. We pay them well, we treat them well, we get a piece of their IP when we develop it into something else. And it makes them want to come back and pitch us again and again and again, because we know that they're, they know that we're going to take their storytelling extremely seriously and, and make it in sort of housed in the most beautiful possible, you know, collection package. We don't do very much online content at all. That's a choice um, because we really think a lot of the stories that we tell are best suited to be in a long form print format with incredible original illustrations or photography or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so this is the magazine. We have, uh, technically, it's three times a year. That's a cheat that we deploy. It's, we say it's quarterly. So if you subscribe, you get a total of four issues. But essentially, we have, um, we're up to issue number 19 that is now out into the world. Um, and we try to time them to parts of the year in which we know people are going to be really excited to, to get their hands on tennis, whether that's holiday or summer. Those typically are kind of like our biggest moments. There's some that are themed, but essentially um, they are kind of the a similar mix issue after issue of politics, culture, art, fashion, and uh, a lot of, uh, and we really want to sort of tackle elitism and access. And our trick is that tennis is sort of technically a sport that appeals to the rich, but actually something that um, is way more interesting when played by the public. And so we kind of use the high household income of our top consumers to drive a lot of the content and storytelling around people like me who grew up on public tennis courts and would never be a member of a private club. So there's sort of like a little bit of a streetwear model in which we're positioning ourselves as like a vice or maybe even a supreme where we sell uh, aspirational, but also sort of achievable, uh, you know, kind of stories to, to, to folks who choose to sort of self-affiliate. Um, we also have a very vibrant um, digital storytelling arm. This is relatively new. We have uh, digital series that are designed for YouTube or something called OTT, which is over the top, which is like a, an acronym that is most used when describing a streaming um, channel like a Hulu or, or a Peacock or a Netflix, where you can I think really punch above your weight if you're something that has, um, if you have stories that you own outright. I mentioned earlier IP, intellectual property that appears in our magazine is ours to own along with the creator. And so usually we try to bring those creators into conversations we have with streamers. This year we'll do a, a documentary with A24, for example, that originated with a story in the magazine. And that's something that, again, allows us to really punch above our weight um, although as a business model, I would say documentary films is probably not the way to get rich. Um, if you're somebody who's transitioning or, or looking to make the most hay of your, um, your media output, it's, it's more exciting from a sort of brand halo perspective. Um, although, you know, the checks clear the bank and we're happy to have them as part of our revenue mix. Um, we have a website, as I mentioned, we don't put very much on it. We use it mostly as a store. And the reason we do that is we don't want the journalism that we do in the magazine to be undiscovered. So we'll be really thoughtful about pushing some of it out largely through our newsletter, but most, mostly our website is about um, giving you ways to touch our brand. And again, I think this is probably appalling to a lot of people who came up in the universe where all content wants to be free and it wants to be on the internet. Um, those are not notions that we ever subscribe to. And I think that frankly, that approach has killed most of the mass media sites that aren't, um, that haven't funneled online readers into subscribers. And so we just don't think ad supported content on the internet is, is worth our time. And we would rather somebody buy a shirt than read a story. Um, and if they're going to read something, we want them to, to buy the magazine or watch one of the films that we create out of a story in the magazine, if that makes sense. Um, like I said, the, our digital content suite is very, very much about, you're probably sensing a theme at this point in my presentation, which is we have the ability to really get somebody into our world and turn them into a massive fan. So a lot of people in our space come to all of our events. They listen to every single one of our podcasts, whether it's on our sort of flagship program or our nascent network that we've been able to create off of our flagship program. And all of it was, again, with the idea of sort of super serving this tennis culture person. This is something that we make for free, 
but we're able to sort of sell in campaigns with um, brand partners when um, when we have a story that kind of lends itself well to multiple formats. And again, it's another sort of lever. We don't sell the podcast on its own. Again, ad supported is not our model. Our model is very much about um, a holistic relationship. And I'll get more into that later when I talk about Fila. Um, like I said, our newsletter, it tons of people open it. We have a very, very fervent audience. And whenever we have a story to deliver, which we do every Friday or um, sort of sneak peeks, invitations to events or um, our uh, a product drop because we just had a new t-shirt color in time for Wimbledon, it goes in this newsletter format. We figured that if we're going to do digital content, we want it to be very, very high touch and basically very actionable. People are opting into getting this. They're opting into opening it and reading it. And then usually more often than not, they're opting into doing something at the end, whether that's buying something that we make or um, subscribing to our podcast or showing up to one of our events. We want to basically be very 360 in the way we interact with our audience. And this is sort of what our audience is. Um, that number for social impressions is a little bit old. We're up around technically six this past month, but safer average is probably five. Um, but again, because we have a really high rate of digital engagement in social and a lot of the you know uh, sort of newsletter and podcasts, we're able to punch way, way, way above our weight as a quarterly magazine because we are reaching these people who are willing to wait for the mail to show up with their beautiful issue. And in the meantime, they're very, very engaged in consuming the kind of Instagram and other social content that we give them between issues, which you know for us has been a very, very, very useful way to kind of build out the universe of our world. If you go to our Instagram feed, it's very sort of aspirational, but not in, a, in a, an elitist way. It's just more it's storytelling in a way that, you know, allows us to have fun too when we're waiting for an issue to be, you know, shipped from the printer. Um, this is something that I want to really spend a lot of time on just because it's going to set up the case study I'm going to go into, but also it's a way for us, especially as we grew our circulation, as we grew our subscriber base, which is still growing and, you know, probably realistically going to cap out around 100,000. Um, in terms of print magazine circulation, which is you know, a healthy number for us, but not gonna set anybody's hair on fire. Really our agency work, which is something that is our work with brands has basically enabled us to thrive from the beginning. And it's interesting because it has a very close relationship with our editorial product. We found as soon as we launched the magazine that people were really, really interested in our storytelling, our visual identity, a lot of the um, ways in which we were marrying culture and tennis in a way that was fresh and new, I would say probably still feels pretty fresh and new, and were offering us way more money than what a slow growth in subscribers month on month was gonna afford us the ability to do um, in a way that you know allowed us to pay bills. And so what we decided very early on was that this was gonna be a crucial component of our work as long as we had two sort of safeguards in place. Number one, we would have complete editorial control over the output of this agency. Because we're not an agency first, we didn't feel like we had to respond to RFPs from brands. We had to go chase dollars from, you know, Clorox and worse. But instead, we would be thoughtful about the kind of work that we did in the sense that we knew it would appeal to our audience. It wouldn't alienate our audience, but instead it would add to their sort of experience with us. And the second safeguard we put in was that it um, it never overtake the ultimate work of the mission of Racket, which is to sort of democratize tennis and make it a lot more accessible. And so as long as those sort of rubrics are met, we felt like this was a really smart way to, again, immediately and more impactfully grow. And so a look on this slide is some of the projects that our creative agency has done. Um, you see work here for Adidas, for Singapore. We did a giant sort of editorial piece for um, Lacoste, which has sort of been a recurring guide series for us. And again, I want to stress, like we don't, um, we have editorial control over these 100%, which is why we take them on. And we also, in a way that I think is a real step forward from a lot of the firewall that existed between the business units and the editorial units when I was working at newsrooms at the Washington Post or Time or WNYC or, or a number of other places, which is we utilize editorial 
creative to make these. So we hire writers, we hire photographers, we hire designers, et cetera, who work on both editorial projects and these projects. And as a result, we're able to pay them very, very well. And the quality is very, very high. And I think this is a larger trend in the, in the media landscape where you have brands, instead of going to a creative agency, which then turns around and comes to a, a company like mine, brands are now coming directly to us. All three of these worked directly with the companies that they are for. And the fourth that you'll see over on the right is our watch, which I'll get to in a little bit. But essentially, by using editorial types to make this work, we're able to pay them very well and keep the, you know, keep their lights on, but also give our clients when we choose to take them on. And I, again, I want to emphasize, we are choosing very carefully which companies we work with and what occasions and allowing ourselves to have complete editorial control, but it really allows us to make better products. And so because of that, we're able to, you know, do a few projects a year that are really, really special and create relationships that last for years on end. We're going to do another Adidas project this year. We did a couple after this Stan Smith one you're looking at, and the same with WTA and Lacoste. And so for us, this again, looks very similar to our editorial. And that is because we have essentially the same staff working on both. And we don't tend to cover or have dialogues in our editorial publication about, you know, um, the ethics of Fred Perry as a symbol used for the Proud Boys, for example. Um, and if we did, we would insist that Fred Perry, you know, deal with it. And so for us, again, we are, we, we have the privilege of being able to direct our brand relationships. And as such, we have complete sort of editorial control over what happens with those. And we're able to do stuff that I think is really exceptional. Um, we have events, as I mentioned very briefly at the top, we're going to be doing, a, we're putting a tennis court on top of Radio City Music Hall. In a week, I'm going to London to do our garden party racket house. This is a way for us to create basically a, an experience where people are walking into the pages of our magazine. This is something that should feel very immediate. We keep it invite only. We don't sell tickets to it. I was talking earlier today with a, a woman who runs a travel publication about what their racket house is going to look like. Is it going to be a small guided tour for a few super users who for whom price is no problem? Is it going to be creating a content series? Is it going to be a, a chance to you know, work with a brand and maybe launch a product? In our case, it's all three of those things. And again, I can talk more about that if you guys are interested, but essentially this racket house concept allows us to really go deep on um, three of our pillars, which are content, commerce, and community in a way that um, stays true to who we are, frankly, it affects the bottom line in a very big way and can create content for us that lives before, during, and after each of these events. We tend to do about, <clears throat> excuse me, three or four of these a year. Um, yeah, content and editorial. I've sort of hit on this note, but essentially we're, we're going back and forth between this idea of storytelling as a branded and also an editorial tool. Um, and we don't tend to differentiate so, so much between the two of them because we can. <clears throat> and also it allows us to do better work. Um, we also do merchandise co collabs. This is the watch that you saw on an earlier slide. We released one this, uh, this spring, just a couple of weeks ago. It sold out in a day, despite the fact that it was 2000 bucks. I'm not here to tell every you know, independent media company owner they should do a $2,000 watch. I frankly was shocked that people bought them. We also only made a handful and we try to make sure that there are many, many price points for people to sort of walk into our world, including and not limited to you know, a free newsletter, a free podcast, and free invitations to events. But sometimes we do want to transact on the fact that we've built a brand that's very aspirational. And when we do do that, we don't spare any expense and we never put things on sale. And so on occasion, it makes sense for brands, I think, um, in the media space who can transact on something that feels very um, audience service to, to do this. The, the middle column is a skateboard we released with a very cool streetwear brand. And the top picture is our first collab collection with Adidas. It was two shirts, two jackets, and two different pairs of shoes. And again, all of this stuff sold out in a day or two because it's small, it's a hype release, and it's really being marketed to our core audience of subscribers and event attendees um, because we know who they are because they come to our events and we meet them. Um, now I'm going to go into a little bit of the Fila experience just because this is one of my favorite case studies that we've done. And it really represents the way that we've been able to kind of like punch 
above our weight as a creative agency while also staying very, very true to who we are as an editorial outfit. Um, essentially, Racket uh, appealed to the Fila folks when they realized that they had found a trove of an old designer's work in the town that Fila came from, which is a town in the Piedmont of Italy called Biella. And the story of Fila, which was now a international conglomerate owned by a um, Seoul based uh, multinational corporation, they felt had lost a little bit of its history, its legacy. And what they asked us to do was to figure out some way of telling the story about where it all started. And by them rediscovering this trove of an old designer, his name was Pier, Pier Luigi Rolando, by discovering an old trove of Pier Luigi Rolando's designs, which are most famously captured on Bjorn Borg and his short, short striped headband and sort of checkered board shirt um, was a way for Fila to kind of reorient itself towards its legacy, but also be introduced to our audience and a new audience who maybe didn't know it, them as anything other than a streetwear brand they see uh, selling cheaply made shoes on Instagram, right? And so they came to us, oops, I didn't mean to do that. They came to us, um, basically to ask what we thought would be the most effective way to do this. And you have to understand when you are making a print product, um, especially one that has some fervent readers and is known for its design and beauty, don't underestimate how rare that is because most creative agencies, most people who work with brands, most internal people at a brand, the only storytelling tool or lever that they usually know how to pull is creating a video or some kind of digital content or both. And so what we pitched them was essentially a continuation of a catalog. They made a catalog back that stopped in 1983, I believe, basically from like the mid seventies up until the early eighties called the Fila newsletter. And it stopped at issue number 11. And it was made essentially as a way to keep tabs on what the brand was doing between, um, between collections, what they were working on, what some of the new collections were going to be. Maybe they were going to put a new, um, maybe they were going to put a new uh, brand ambassador like Reinhold Messler, the, you know, elusive Dolomite based Alpine climber in a bunch of climbing gear. And here's a preview of that so people could buy it. But essentially it sort of told the story of the brand. And we thought, what a cool receptacle, what a cool print-based receptacle that they created, that they came up with, that they used to ship out a couple of times a year um, that we could kind of revive. And we pitched them on this idea, like, send us to the archive, we'll pour through some old photos, we'll pour through, um, you know, some of the, uh, I want to show you, I'm going to stop my screen share just so I can show you a little bit more detail about this case study. So tell me if this works. But essentially, they gave us kind of carte blanche to go and give um, give this project a refresh, give it um, essentially a, a new life and put it in front of a new people. So what we came up with was a continuation of the newsletter. And we just decided that our logo was gonna be on it because we were proud of it. And we wanted it to go um, to all of our subscribers and all of our newsstand buyers, but that it would look like the newsletter that they used to put out had never stopped. And so we did the entirety of the fonts, the design the photo selection as if it was from the early 80s. And you can see the way that the spacing on the text is, the font that we're using. Um, these photos, if you look at the small tiles on this, uh, on this screen here, that's Reinhold Nestler, Fila Newsletter number three. There's number two with Bjorn Borg with that famous design, et cetera. You see that we're referencing and continuing this sort of project. Again, I wanna emphasize, this was a print product. I'm showing it to you online because it's a PDF that exists on my computer, but nobody exists, nobody encountered this thing other than in a print format, which again, made me very, very excited. And so as you go through what we created, we created new journalism. We paid our incredible contributors who also write for the magazine, the photographers who also shoot for us regularly. We paid them top dollar so that we could get really, really good content, but we all did it like it was this time capsule. And we interviewed current sort of, um, you know, current uh, stars and, and voices. Like this is not only Bjorn Borg, but it's his son, who's now also a Fila brand ambassador. 
in some cases, and this might seem a little bit inside baseball, but this is kind of what racket is known for. Um, there's a, there's a spelling mistake. So in this last panel here, they have Eon Tyriac, who was a famous and like terrible sport, if I'm being honest, um, from Romania. They mistakenly called him John. So we replicated the fact that it was John and put a little asterisk there where you see, but down here we have, his name is John Tyriac. So for us, again, looking at this contemporary storytelling done in this model that was very, very, you know, seeped in nostalgia without being backwards, but instead sort of saying like, oh, this is what Fila used to be about. And if anybody's encountering the brand now, they'll encounter the fact that it comes from somewhere and that storytelling sort of tradition continues. And in fact, that's something that I want to sort of end on, which is the idea that when you think about how brands can interface with media companies, again, most of them are not used to interfacing with print whatsoever. And the level of storytelling that they're typically getting is not bad, but it's usually done by the lens of a creative agency, you know, sort of junior employee. And so they're not going to get incredible journalists and incredible sort of media centric, um, you know, practitioners at their, at their disruptive. So you can kind of look here at the, the recap recreated, but essentially this 20 page special issue went out bundled with the issues of our magazine. So it went to all of our subscribers. And as I mentioned, we gave it to a few of our really key newsstand um, partners in London, in Berlin, in Milan, in um, LA. I'm not sure if there were any in Vancouver, but I know Queen's Books in Toronto had some. Um, and so this became like a cult item. We didn't sell it on its own. It was only available bundled with the issue. But because we had done it, our diehards became basically completists and asked us to reissue it, which we didn't do because Fila owns it. Um, and now it's on eBay for a couple hundred bucks per issue. And so for us, like just finding this really exciting sort of storytelling model that could be deployed as in service of a story we really believed in and done in a way that our users, our audience, our print subscribers weren't mad about getting, but instead sought after if for some reason they didn't get their hands on it, became a really good case study in how to use a relationship with a brand, all the storytelling tools that are at the disposal of a, of a journalist and a team of journalists and creators and visual, uh, you know, and visual creators to do something that feels very right. And also, by the way, made us a couple hundred thousand dollars. And so a couple of those projects is worth to me and to our team, both because of the creative sort of fulfillment we get doing them, but also the way we're able to pay our contributors and also the way that we are um, able to kind of further our journalistic storytelling is worth so much more to us than if we went after scale and audience and sold ads by the quarter page, if that makes sense. And so everything that we think about doing, and I don't want to emphasize that we're doing this all the time. We do a couple of these at most a year. And the ones we do, like I said, we have to have complete editorial control. We have to be able to, to plausibly give our audience something that they would want, which in this case is some beautiful pictures of store of clothes that haven't existed in a long time, a new collection of clothes that Fila had created to pay homage to this history, and just a lot of really cool storytelling that originated in this part of Italy that most people probably hadn't been to. Um, and because we're choosy about it, and because we know our audience is going to be receptive, we're able to charge a lot of money, and we're able to have fun doing it in a way that feels extremely on brand for us. And also, by the way, helps with all the other Halo stuff, brand awareness, um, event attendance, et cetera, because we also ended up having an event with Fila and Palm Springs to sort of co coincide with this release. And so for me, a lot of the projects we do are essentially about making sure our storytelling can really translate and using the skills that we know as journalists we, we possess that are in, in high demand and figuring out when and how to bring them to bear in a way that essentially keeps the rest of our operation really, you know, happy from a financial viewpoint. So thank you for allowing me to talk about something so outrageously commercial, as I just want to emphasize, I did not come from the brand world. I came from the journalism world. I have a degree in magazine journalism. Most of my, my life has been spent on the editorial side, um, but, allow, but being able to work with this other world, I wish as good as my University of Missouri education in journalism was, um, you know, and I have some notes. I do really wish that they had spent more time talking about business. I really wish that journalism schools talked a little bit more about how the sausage is made because the truth is 
basically since I graduated in 2002, media has been fragmented and in danger. And whether we like it or not, most of us who work in media have to understand how the business side works, either because we're in our own employ or we're working for something small that needs to be able to navigate really t- tough waters. And if you know how to do it, or if you are you know, sort of endeavoring to learn, it's not particularly hard. And you'll find that your skill set is way, 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 way in demand by the other side of, of that sort of divide. Um, and that's certainly what we found here. So yeah, any questions or, or follow-up comments, or if you want me to dive deep into anything else, um, I'm more than happy to, but hopefully that gave you an idea about kind of how we think about this, who we are, and how that sort of from the jump storytelling muscle that we have has been able to, you know, really keep our business humming and, and I wouldn't say afloat, but humming and, and sort of self-perpetuating. So yeah, thanks for listening to me monologue and any questions I'm, I'm more than happy to take. Hey, Caitlin, I noticed uh, your household income is super high. So you don't sell ads on the back of that. So um, I'm wondering how you're parlaying that into revenue for yourself. Is that from the agency side? Actually, no, it's mostly experiential. Okay. So that's who buys a $2,000 watch. Right. Do I? Absolutely not. I think watches are kind of dumb, but... (laughs) We made 50 of them. They were priced to sell and they did because we knew that that HHI was really going to drive a core consumer. I mean, also we took care to like, you know, work with somebody who loved them and makes them beautiful and blah, blah, blah. If we ever do a, I mean, Racket's never going to do a boat, but if we did a boat, that's who we're going to market it to. Right. Right. So yeah, good question. I can read it out for you. Sure. So basically I would love to hear more about how you choose the brands that you work with, because you did say that uh, you don't respond to uh, CFPs and you're very picky about the brands that you work with. And how does that conversation go about maintaining editorial control? It, great, great questions. And it's an easy one. Um, the conversations are typically very intense when we get brand interest um, because my partner, David, is way more suspicious of money than I am. I'm also the publisher. So this is a healthy dynamic. It's really... A lot of times when people ask me like how I'm starting a company or especially I'm starting a media company, what's like the number one piece of advice? And my advice always is have at least one partner so that it's not just you because you'll definitely come, you know, hopefully have some healthy tension around this sort of stuff. Um, And so David's attitude basically is always, is this a party I would want to go to? Is this a product I would want to actually use? Is this a shirt I would wear? Is this something that I would actually, you know, want to turn around and give, give to my wife or friend or whatever it is? So that's kind of the sort of more humanistic side of things. From a business side of things, we are extremely picky because we're small and because I can't ask our creative director to take time off of making one of our home products unless it's going to be for something that's really exceptional on behalf of a brand, because as I mentioned, we tend to use a lot of the same folks for both. And when we haven't done that, we've gotten into a lot of trouble because the quality hasn't been very good. Um, If we work with people who just do branded content, for example, or if we work with people who just do sort of commercial illustrations or commercial copywriting. Um, And so we've learned the hard way, like we really do have to be choosier and and have a higher price point for those brands. Um, the, The more complicated answer is for us in our space, we love doing projects where there's a history element Um, and it doesn't hurt if there's a really strong visual component. And if there's a history element, turns out there probably will be a strong visual component at some point. And that allows us to really talk about where we've been so we can talk about where we're going and understanding, of course, that the world of tennis, despite, I would say, being on the right side of history when it comes to, for the most part, but more than it hasn't, when it comes to race, sexual orientation, inclusion, trans rights, gender parity, you know, there's still a lot, lot, lot of work to be done. So we, I also, and this is sort of table stakes for me. So I forgive me for not laying it out. We are so, so, so committed and continue to be committed to having representative voices in our magazine with our brands, in our commercial work. Um, And we don't do this to pat ourselves on the back. We do it because it's good business and it's the right thing to do, but we do it because it's good business. And because tennis has not done a good job of appealing to giant swaths of the world necessarily that when we bring somebody in to do commercial work or work with a brand or work with any of our editorial entities, um, we're just lucky to be able to say like, Oh, this is, 
yet another way we can find new readers and new audience and new mm-hmm. and new subscribers. So I think that's another thing that I sort of regret not mentioning earlier because it's a key tenant of, of who we are. Um, but also it, it factors into what kind of brands we work with. Like we're not gonna, we're not, you know, taking money from Exxon or Rolex even for that matter, you know, uh, which is mostly male, mostly white and um, not committed to the DEI principles that we want to see. Whereas Fila is, and they have no problem when we bring it up in a meeting, if somebody, somebody's lips tighten, we know that they're not a good partner for us because we're not going to, we're not going to not talk about that in our work. And so um, that's another way. I also see a really good question here from Miriam. I'm going to answer if that's okay. Yeah. And if I can um, clarify that question, the reason I'm asking is because your website is quite unusual uh, for a publication that has such a focus on keeping a certain standard with the editorial, but yet when you come to your website, it's mostly a commercial space. So I'm just curious for somebody who comes to your brand first, how do you draw them into the editorial side of things so that they start to explore your brand and it's move a into question. your world? Great question. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, our website is not usually the front door to discover us. I think at a certain point as we grow, it will be. And when we devote more resources to search and to making um, more of our sort of presence known, I don't ever think we're going to be a blog just because I don't really believe in um, ad supported content on the internet there's a chance that we'll kind of expand our subscription model to be like, okay, and you get a watch every year and you get unlimited, you know, and you get a paywall content access. Right. Um, But for right now we have so few people who are coming to racket.com for a thing. Mm. For the most part, people are coming to us because they um, are swiping up on an Instagram uh, piece, Mm -hmm. a picture, a, um, or they're clicking on a tweet that has a specific story in it because we've scooped somebody. And so it's the short answer is it's kind of, it's just kind of not our priority. And the longer answer it's later in our evolution of like, if we had started with $10 million is the way that some media companies, I don't, I, I wish more, but we didn't, we started with, you know, $10,000 from each of us and a little bit of money from our Kickstarter. And so yeah building a website that was content first, that was serving casual internet readers was just so not, uh, not remotely on our list of priorities that most people who are finding our website are finding um, us through one specific thing. And we're trying to funnel them into um, buying something, not, right. um, not, cons- not sticking around and scrolling. Well, that mm-hmm. will change, but it's, for now it's, it's sort of given our limited resources, how we've decided yep. to prioritize what we do. 